together with Mr. James Matthews. Yes. Uh, Mr. Warnock, Queen's Council, and Mr. Clemens appear for the respondent. Mr. Clemens is joining us by video link. Um, Ms. Gallagher, Queen's Council, and Mr. Green appear for the interveners. My lady, can I just check uh, the materials the court has? Uh, hopefully you have an appeal bundle and a supplemental bundle. Uh, and together with a bundle of authorities, we've placed uh, before you just two additions to go in the authorities. I hope they can be squeezed in your files. Um, one is Saadi, I'm just going to refer to that briefly, shortly, the rules of interpretation. And then there's also uh, an excerpt from the Oxford English Dictionary on the words purpose and effect. I'll turn to those by May. Um, hopefully the court also has a proposed timetable. Yes, thank you very much for providing that. So my, my, my lady will see, we aim to finish by about midday tomorrow. Hopefully that allows us a little wriggle room, but we may go shorter. Yes. Um, just before I start, can I um, apologise in advance? Because of COVID restrictions, we don't have cups. So, yeah, I may at some stage ungainly swig uh, from the water bottle. I hope that's not we'll good company, so I don't know about that. <clears throat> so, my ladies, my lord, the important question raised by this appeal, or the important questions raised by this appeal, are whether the power contained in Section 38 of PACE to detain children in their own interest or for their own protection is compatible with Article 5 ECHR, and whether, even if it is, the threshold for establishing the legality of detention can be met on the facts of this case. And I, I characterize those questions as important not only because of the constitutional significance of the relief that is sought, but because of the gravity of the subject matter <coughs> and its context. As the court well knows, the claim concerns not simply the fundamental right of liberty, always a matter of the utmost import, but arises in the context of the incarceration of children overnight in adult police cells with the well-recognized attendant risks to their welfare. Those wide, that wider context, those concerns about the impact of detention on children, as well as the relevant international framework, are set out in the written submissions of the interveners. <coughs> we gratefully adopt them, but my oral submissions will not duplicate them. Can I summarize our position through two broad propositions? My primary submission is simple. The appellant's detention was effected for the purpose of protecting him from others applying the power in Section 38. Detention for that purpose is not permitted under the relevant limb of Article 5 1c, nor any other provisions of Article 5. The relevant limb of 5 1c authorises detention where it has been effected for the purpose of bringing a person before the court not for other purposes. And thus a power that authorises detention to be effected for another purpose, beyond that expressly provided for, is incompatible with the convention rights afforded in Article 5. <coughs> now the counter-argument, advanced by the respondent and applied by his lordship, requires a reading of the meaning of affected for a purpose within 5.1c that divorces it from the actual reason for the deprivation of liberty. It's said that so long as the detained person will, as a matter of fact, be brought before the court, then Article 5.1c can be made out irrespective of the actual reason governing the decision <coughs> to detain. And my ladies, my lord, I'll seek to show in submissions that this interpretation fails to apply the ordinary meaning of the text. It produces a result that is in discord with the fundamental principles underlying Article 5, and on close analysis, <coughs> is unsupported by the line of authorities relied upon. That's my primary submission. My secondary alternative submission is advanced on the unchallenged proposition that in order, in order to justify detention, uh, a compli convention compliant detention under Section 38, the power can only be exercised in exceptional circumstances, 
and the justification must be convincingly demonstrated by the detainer. For the reasons explained by the intervener, the position must be a fortiori. Sorry, Mr. Hammond, it's my fault. Not at all. I'm struggling to keep up, sorry. It can only be exercised in exceptional circumstances. And the justification must be convincingly demonstrated. And I'll show my lady the passages that, that gives emphasis to that. And that's in respect of anybody who is detained under Section 38. Uh, and that the judge didn't, there was no dispute about that, but it's a question whether it's met on the fact. Yes, my lady. Yes. But, but, but we say to that principle, uh, 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 both about exceptional circumstances and the requirement to convincingly demonstrate that they are met, those apply across the board to whoever's been detained. The position must be, we would submit, not least for the reasons given by the interveners, a fortiori in respect of children. But both the threshold of exceptionality and the need to justify it convincingly. And at the end of my submissions, I'll seek to show, by reference to the evidence that was before his lordship, that that test can't be made out here if it's to have real meaning. <clears throat> Before I uh, turn to the substance uh, of my submissions, can I very briefly just give emphasis to one aspect of the facts in this case, which is the role, the primary role that detention for own protection played? And secondly, very briefly, legal framework, just a few observations about the structure of Section 38 and Article 5. So firstly, on the facts, there are very the, the, the facts are set out by his lordship between paragraphs 2 and 8 of his judgment. Page 54 of the bundle. There are only limited facts that are relevant to this case, no, none of which are in dispute. The only feature I wish to just give some emphasis to, if I may, is the centrality of the own protection clause in section 38 to the actual decision to deny bail uh, in this case. Because it's clear, and we don't understand it to be in dispute, that the primary reason that the appellant was detained was the belief that it would protect him from others. There's no suggestion on the record, pleadings, or evidence that this was a power exercise for the purpose of bringing him before a court. Can I just show you very briefly the relevant documents? It might be helpful to start firstly with the custody record. You'll find that in the appeal bundle, tab 14, page 146. You'll see the entry there at 1953 from Sergeant Smith. Bail refused, the detained person informed, he's detained to appear uh, the next uh, day. And you can see there the reasons for refusing bail. I believe necessary to further detain the person for their own protection, that's first. The detained person has been ar arrested for a non-imprisonable offence, believed that necessary. That was wrong, wasn't it? I mean, these were imprisonable offences. Yes. So this is what, that's just a glitch. That, 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 that would be a glitch, and uh, uh, not, not material. To, to the appeal. Uh, believe necessary to further detain to prevent physical <coughs> injury to another person. The detained person has been arrested for an imprisonable offence uh, and believe necessary to further detain in order to prevent the commission of the further offence. And then you can see the grounds are the detained person has been involved in a gang related fight where he sustained injuries that required hospital treatment. It's feared that if released on bail, there will be repercussions where he may sustain further injuries or inflict violence upon his original intended victims and therefore bail refused. Um, evidence was um, served in this case, and that's from um, Sergeant Smith, and we'll find that behind tab 13 of the bundle. Uh, 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 two statements, um, but that's paragraph two of the first statement, page 115. The sergeant makes plain he has no recollection at all uh, of the um, his decision to detain and that his statement derives from the custody record. There are and there were several iterations of the pleadings in this case. Um, could I just start by showing you the 
last version of the defence, which you'll find behind tab 11. I haven't got tabs, so if you could just give I'm me so the sorry. page number. 99, number. my lady. 99. You can see that the amendment arises uh, out of um, the claim for a declaration of incompatibility. Um, there's a synopsis uh, of the first defendant's defense from paragraph one. If I could just show you paragraph 1.4, page 100. Uh, the claimant's detention was lawful in its inception and duration. Police bail was refused primarily because of the legitimate fears for the claimant's safety. This is in the amended offence, but it, it, that, that was an averment that was constant throughout. And the emphasis that to the primary reason for detention, one can find again if one turns to paragraph 4.4 .4 on page 102. A claimant's detention was appropriately reviewed. Bail was refused primarily on the basis that the claimant's continued detention was desirable and necessary in his own interests and for his own protection, and then the disamendment, and because it was considered that his parents could not properly control or protect him, and when a social services care placement was not available. At some point, um, Mr. Herr, I would like you to deal with the question of the primarily and secondarily. Yes, of course. I was going to, I was and, going to, and the consequence of that. Yes, of course. I was going to come, I was going to come to that just in a moment. Yes. Can I just show you? Just before I do, yes, just how it's put in the uh, amended particulars of claim. Yes. Um, these post-date the amended defence, <clears throat> but they were. You'll find them at, from page 107. The purpose was to provide the court with as much clarity as possible as to what the issue was. So they were essentially a start again to focus on the issue of the compatibility of section 38. And you can see that, not least, from paragraph uh, uh, um, 3, page 108. Which is premised upon, you can see, not least from the declaration sought under 2, that it was the <coughs> primary reason for detention. Just going back to paragraph 4.4 of the amended defence, it probably doesn't matter at all, but what's the factual basis for the assertion that the parents' ability to control was considered if Sergeant Smith couldn't remember anything. Well, that could only be by way of inference from Sergeant Smith in the fact that uh, the event, the uh, uh, alleged offence, took place at a time in which the appellant was in the care of his parents. That's, that's, that, I think, is the only possible inference. And when the social services care placement was not available again, no, no well, I'm going to come back to that on ground I three, if I, if I may, my lady, because right. actually there, there, is, there is far in Sergeant Smith's second statement where he says that there, at that time there was no secure accommodation available from the local authority. There is nothing in the documentation or the evidence to suggest that there was any consideration given to any other form of accommodation from the local authority. And that is one aspect that we say fatally undermines the justification for detention, even if you're against us, on compatibility. Is that part of your pleaded case? Well, it... it uh, but I'd not put with that degree of clarity, no. Well, but it arises it, out of it. I mean, it, it no, isn't part no. of the pleaded case. Yeah. Well, but, but I it, mean, I just say that because yes, of course. we're all conscious of what's been raised by the interveners. Yes, of course. What the respondent has had to say about that. Yes, of course. Um, yes. I mean, it, 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 it arises really out of the <coughs> way that the, that the hearing proceeded and the way that the issues were ventilated before his lordship below. Can I deal with that in a little more, in a, in a little more detail later, if I may? So I was just showing you the um, amended particulars of claim from page 107 uh, onwards, yes. which again are designed to just to really focus the issues on section 38 <coughs> and section 38 um, alone. Yes. Um, 
So I've shown you paragraph three. Paragraph seven again flags up that this is about the primary reason for detention. You can see that we give an emphasis to the passage from the custody record, and we do the same at paragraph 16. Now, there was no um, amendment from the defendant as a result of receipt of a pleading. Now, his lordship below dealt with the matter head on that this is all about the primary reason for detention. And he notes at paragraph 60 of his judgment that because he's concentrated on that issue, he didn't have to consider the uh, secondary grounds of detention, not least the question as to whether or not, even if the primary ground was shown to be incompatible or otherwise inapplicable, whether or not the detention could nevertheless be justified. Um, so, so the court has our position on, on that. Um, as we put below before his lordship, is where a party has pleaded in express terms a primary reason, and they have then themselves described it as a primary reason, any ambiguity in the legal potency of what must be, by definition, secondary grounds, inures against the party with the burden of proving the legality of the detention. And in the absence of evidence, or a pleading that asserts and demonstrates that the claimant would nevertheless have been detained irrespective of concerns about his own protection, the burden, that burden of proof cannot be discharged. If that, um, let's assume for the moment, for the sake of argument, that that's not an argument which finds that lands with us with some of us, but what would, you, what would you say was the legal consequence of, a, of the secondary <coughs> reason valid, but the primary one not? Well, my lady, it depends upon the course that the court adopts. I mean, it makes no difference, we would say, to the question of compatibility and grounds one yeah. and two. It, 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 it may make a difference to quantum. We would say that the claimant would nevertheless, if we, if we lose on grounds one and two, but succeed on ground three, uh, uh, we would, the appellant would be entitled to some compensation because of the express terms of Article 5.5. There's been a breach of his Article 5.1 rights, therefore it follows he must have a right to just satisfaction. But there may be an implication if the court were to conclude, he would have been detained in any event. So I hope, I hope that answers my, my lady's question. <coughs> but, but we say, we would, we, our primary submission would be that isn't a route that's open to the court. Because you can't fill in the blanks on the detainer's behalf, such as the onus, whether in common law or under the convention, on a person who deprives them of, the, of their liberty, having to justify, strictly justify the basis for it, if you, dis you yourself describe the primary reason, there's no basis for the court to fill in the gaps and say the secondary reason must also have had potency. Um, Mr. Herman, can you help me please with one feature of the judgment below? <clears throat> Paragraph one begins the matters now in dispute, su suggesting certainly to my mind, that <coughs> other matters have been disputed in the past but aren't anymore. Yes. And paragraph 60, to which you just invited our attention, it includes, <coughs> as the third sentence, the concern that the claimant might himself commit offences was, as the claimant concedes, also a valid reason to detain him. Speaking for myself, I don't understand how that fits in with the submission you've just made. Well, my lord, I think that has to be read to, to, to be read consistently with the submissions that I made below and I advanced before this court. It has to be read as saying there is 
no doubt a power to detain people for those secondary reasons, a power that is indeed compatible with Article 5. My Lord, we, we were not conceding that the claimant would have been detained in any event. There we are, Mr. Hermie, you, you were there. But the, the words, to my mind, the words, as the claimant concedes, also a valid reason to detain him appear to relate to the actual facts of this actual case. But my Lord, if my Lord then looks at the last sentence, it may be thought that that um, reflects the debate as to whether or not those secondary reasons were causally potent, i.e. whether those secondary reasons would nevertheless have caused uh, uh, the sergeant to authorise detention. But, but, but why? The, the, the judge has said in paragraph 60, so far, I've concentrated on detention for his own protection. <clears throat> for the reasons I've given, this was compatible with Article 5. The concern that he might himself commit offences was, as the claimant concedes, also a valid reason to detain. Therefore, not necessary to consider the potentially difficult questions that might have arisen had only one of the reasons been legitimate. Yes. <clears throat> Why doesn't that cover the situation where the judge had reached the opposite conclusion on detention for own protection and was left with the other valid reason. Because the potentially difficult question that his lordship said he wasn't going to decide is what happens if um, I decide that uh, it wasn't lawful under Section 38. Would those secondary reasons come to the rescue of the respondent? That's, that's, which, is, which is the question. Um, my lady, my lords, I think what, what I need to do, because I... D I don't want to take any form of advantage in having been before the learned judge at first instance, is we'll need to go back and very carefully check precisely what I said, so there's nothing that I'm saying that is capable of not giving you the correct and accurate answer. But certainly, so far as I can help you on my feet now, that, that, that's our understanding of the position before the learned judge. But I'll obviously double check that to make yes. sure I'm putting it fairly. Thank you. <clears throat> Could I turn then, that's all I was intending to say on, on, on the facts and just to make that one submission, which is it inures against the respondent the absence of a positive case that he would have been detained in any event on a secondary ground. That inures against the defendant as a matter of first principle, we say. Could I then turn to the, just very again, very briefly, to the legal framework, both Section 38 and Article 5, and find Section 38 in the authorities bundle behind the second divider. <coughs> Can I just flag up the key provisions and then just make two observations about it? So we can see under section one that it arises where a person has been arrested for an offence otherwise than under a warrant, um, that the custody officer shall order release uh, either on bail or without bail unless, and then it sets out the circumstances in which <coughs> bail can be uh, denied. Under A, the provisions relate to adults. And we see they're set out from Roman numeral one through to Roman numeral five, what we'd say are the classic grounds, all of which fall comfortably within Article 5.1 for the denial of bail. And then um, just below Roman numeral five, just at the end, you'll see or Roman numeral six, the custody officer has reasonable grounds for believing the detention of the person arrested is necessary for his own protection. And then B, if they are an arrested juvenile, uh, Roman numeral one, if any of the requirements of paragraph A is satisfied, uh, uh, um, or, again, the custody officer has reasonable grounds for believing he ought to be detained in his own interests. <coughs> and then subsection six, you would have seen flagged up by the interveners which is where a custody officer authorises a juvenile to be kept in police detention under subsection 1 above, the custody
custody officer shall, unless he certifies, A, by reason of such circumstances specified in the certificate, it's impractical for him to do so, or B, in the case of an arrested juvenile who has attained the age of 12, no secure accommodation is available, and that keeping him in other local authority accommodation would not be adequate to protect the public from serious harm from him, secure that the arrested um, juvenile is moved to local authority accommodation. And then at seven, you see that the certificate made under six uh, in respect the juvenile shall be produced to the court before which he is first brought thereafter. <clears throat> Just two um, short points on, this, on, on the framework. The first is that I've, is I've identified all the other grounds, say for own protection, own interests, are compatible with Article 5.1c. And the second short point is there is nothing to suggest that the power to detain on own interest or own protection is in any sense dependent upon the existence of those other grounds. That's absolutely clear by the use of the word or. It operates entirely independently of the other grounds. Do we take anything from the um, different the phrase um, own interest for juvenile being broader than for adults? Yes, my lady. Protection versus interest. Yes, my lady. For reasons I was going to develop, I mean, his lordship took the narrower clause of own protection. And we would say if own protection is ultra vires of Article 5, then the position is all the more obvious in respect of own interest because it's, it's clearly broader. I mean, one sees that from the statutory scheme. It incorporates. You can arrest under B1. Well, well, more generally, not just protection. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> can I move to Article 5? It's behind tab 1, obviously, the court will be well aware of the terms of Article 5. Can I just make five short observations? Most of them, I'm afraid, are trite, but it's useful as grounding as to how it relates to the case. Um, First short point is that in order for Article 5 to be engaged at all, there needs to be a deprivation of liberty, not simply a restriction on the right of movement. And we'll, we'll look at Austin in, in, in a moment. Second point is that detention against a person's will in a police cell is the paradigm example of deprivation of liberty engaging Article 5. Third point is that in order to be compliant with Article 5, any power to detain must fall within at least one of the six categories of cases articulated in Article 5.1. As we'll see, they are exhaustive in nature and must be interpreted narrowly. Fourth point is that Article 5 applies to a decision whether or not to grant bail including by a police officer prior to production to court. Just for your notes, see by way of example, the Zadji, paragraph 5, page 584 of the authorities bundle. Fifth point is there is no longer a dispute, although there once was, that the only possible ground upon which this appellant's detention could be justified was Article 5.1c. That contemplates detention in three distinct circumstances. One, on reasonable suspicion of committing an offence. Two, when reasonably necessary to prevent the uh, commission of a commission of an offence. And three, when necessary to prevent somebody fleeing. Um, for your note, see the disarticulation of those three grounds in S and Denmark, paragraph 98, tab 24. And this appeal turns on the first link, detention on reasonable suspicion of committing an offence. And the respondent accepts that if it falls out with, if the detention in this case the re falls out with 5.1c, then section 38 power is incompatible with the Act and the Convention right. <coughs> That's the framework. Can I deal with grounds one and two together? They're really reflections of each other. And can I divide my submissions into six headings? Firstly, the judge's analysis. 
At this stage, I want to do no more than just flag up the steps in his lordship's reasoning. Secondly, article, the foundational principles behind Article 5.1, which I'll suggest are a grounding for interpretation. Thirdly, what are the relevant rules for interpreting a convention provision? How should the court set about that task? Fourthly, the natural and ordinary meaning of Article 5.1c. Fifthly, flexibility, and why the notion of flexibility in the interpretation of Article 5, identified by the judge, has no application to this case. And sixthly and finally, why the Article 5.3 cases, identified by his lordship, do not assist. Start then with his lordship's um, reasoning. Tab 6, page 53 is the start of the judgment. Again, can I just identify, rather than respond to at this stage, his lordship's reasoning? Because it will then help set the framework and identify the target that I need to, 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 to hit. So the heart of his lordship's, it's in four steps one can identify in his lordship's um, reasoning. But the heart of it is at page 71, paragraph 43. where the report rejects the notion that the requirement of the first limb of 5.1c demands that the actual reason for de de demands that the actual reason for deprivation of liberty be for the purpose of bringing a person before the court on suspicion of commission of a criminal charge. So his lordship holds that's not what it really means, properly construed. So long as the intended end point of detention is production to a court, then, subject to other convention protections against detention being arbitrary, etc., Article 5.1c does not inquire into the actual reason for refusing bail. That's the heart of his lordship's uh, 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 analysis, we say. The second strand in his reasoning, one can pick up at paragraph the following paragraph, paragraph 44, when his lordship identifies a strand of reasoning in Strasbourg jurisprudence, which he says uh, 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 um, shows a, fl a flexible reading to the purpose requirement in Article 5.1 is permissible, and his approach is consistent with that. Third step in his lordship's reasoning, paragraphs 45 to 7, he draws support from two Strasbourg cases concerning Article 5.3, in which the reasonableness of the length of detention was assessed by, amongst other things, a, a, a justification that it was necessary to protect the detainee. And fourth step in his Lordship's judgment of paragraph 48, his Lordship considers his approach as consistent with the need to interpret Article 5 in a manner that doesn't make it impractical for the police to fulfill their duties to protect the public and maintain order. And that very much feeds in, as we'll see in the authorities, to the second step of the reasoning about the need for flexibility. So that's how his uh, lordship approached it. Can I start off my attempt to impeach that analysis? by taking the court again to matters of which the court will be aware, which are the well aware, the kind of core foundational principles underlying Article 5. I can do so because the court will be aware of them briefly, but they are an important starting point, we submit, for trying to understand how we interpret 5.1c in a way that is consistent with the underlying principle. Now, the classic statement, which um, one will see, as is the way, uh, repeated throughout um, Article 5 jurisprudence, is the uh, exhaustive nature of the rights in Article 5, 1C, 5 1, and the need to uh, <coughs> interpret them narrowly. Can I just give you one, it's worth pulling up, the most recent Article 5 1 case before the court, which is S against Denmark. That's in tab 24 of the bundle. 
and the well-known off-repeated principle you'll find at paragraph 73 on page 697. I'm going to come back to this case in a bit more detail later in my submissions. The Grand Chamber said this, Article 5 of the Convention is, together with 2, 3, and 4, in the first rank of the fundamental rights that protect the physical security of the individual, and as such, its importance is paramount. Its key purpose is to prevent arbitrary or unjustified deprivations of liberty. Three strands of reasoning in particular may be identified as running through the court's case law. The exhaustive nature of the exceptions, which must be interpreted strictly and which do not allow for the broad range of justifications under other provisions, such as the qualified rights in 8 and 11. The repeated emphasis on the lawfulness of the detention, both procedural and substantive, requiring scrupulous adherence to the rule of law, and the importance of promptness or speediness of the requisite judicial controls. That's um, Strasbourg. It's again passages that have been repeated on a number of occasions in the domestic courts. But can I just give you another kind of insight into the imports of Article 5 constitutionally from the um, opinions of the House of Lords in the case of JJ, which the court will find behind tab 7. Um, this case uh, concerned the legality of what will remember them of non-derogating control orders, whose terms in this case required, amongst other things, subjects to remain at home for up to 18 hours a day. And the issue before the appellate committee was whether that actually amounted to a deprivation of um, liberty. So it's at tab 7. You'll, you'll see that, uh, if you can go through page 66, the uh, Secretary of State put out a particularly strong team to bat uh, on that occasion. And I, I'm relying on it. Um, to give emphasis to the importance of the rights and the narrow room, the tight confines of interpretation. So can I just start with um, just Lord, Lord Bingham, paragraph 5 at page 82. Uh, His Lordship said, as will be seen, paragraph 7 below. The Act is drafted with express reference to Article 5 of the European Convention, which <coughs> sets out what it is. There then follows a list, A to F, of cases in which a person may be deprived of his liberty in accordance with a procedure prescribed by law. The cases listed are those in which any democratic state is likely to exercise a power to detain on sentence following conviction, breach of a court order, arrest on suspicion of a crime, infectious diseases, mental illness, etc. This list as the European Court of Human Rights has repeatedly emphasised, is exhaustive and to be narrowly interpreted. Lordship sets out a selection of the cases. This reflects the importance attached by the Convention to the right to liberty and security. Thus, a person may not be deprived of his liberty unless his case falls within one of the listed classes of case. That proposition, however, is subject to one qualification by Article 15 of the Convention, given a domestic effect by Sections 14 and 16 of the Human Rights Act, a state party's convention may derogate from Article 5 subject to certain formalities. And you'll see that in this case, in that case, the Lordship said it's common ground that none of the cases subject to this appeal fall within A to F, and the United Kingdom has not derogated. It necessarily follows that if, as the controlled persons contend, and the Secretary of State strongly denies, the effect of the obligations imposed on the controlled persons under the control order is to deprive them of their liberty. Such orders are inconsistent with Article 5 of the Convention. So that's a, so a conclusion reached by the majority of the House of Lords. Lord Hoffman was in dissent, but not on the point of principle I'm about to take you to, which we could pick up, please, at paragraph 35, with some further insights into the nature of the rights. Paragraph 34, his Lordship had been referring to balancing exercise inherent in qualified rights, such as Article 8. But at 35, he says, your lordships have not been invited to carry out such an exercise. That's the balance exercise. Instead, um, it's alleged that the orders infringe the rights under Article 5.1, which provides, and you can see, um, uh, uh, no one should be deprived of liberty, subject to various exceptions. The point about the right not to be deprived of one's liberty under Article 
is that subject to the exceptions, it is unqualified. Such is the revulsion against detention without charge or trial, such is this country's attachment to habeas corpus, that the right to liberty ordinarily trumps even the interests of national security. Only in times of war or public emergency threatening the life of the nation may the government derogate, suspend habeas, and imprison people without trial. And then, if we could just turn over to paragraph 37. Why is deprivation of liberty regarded as so quintessential a human right that it trumps even the interest of national security? In my opinion, because it amounts to a complete deprivation of human autonomy and dignity. The prisoner has no freedom of choice about anything. He cannot leave the place to which he has been assigned. He may only eat uh, when and what his jailer permits. The only human beings whom he ever may see or speak to are his jailers and those whom they may allow to visit. He is entirely subject to the will of others. So we uh, approach Article 5, 1, C, therefore, uh, uh, um, mindful of those foundational principles that underline both Article 5 and our common law, the way that common law jealously guards uh, the liberty of the subject. Exhaustive and restrictively interpreted. Could I turn there, then into my third heading as to what those rules of interpretation are? How do we interpret? What are the, what are, what are the, what are the legitimate tools for interpreting the Convention? And in our submission, the appropriate starting place, as it would be with a, a, a domestic piece of legislation, is to look at the ordinary meaning of the words in Article 5.1, assessing what they mean, asking then whether they fit in harmony with those fundamental purposes, or whether such a reading would jar with principle. And that approach to determining the extent of an international treaty right, which is, of course, what Article 5 is, is unremarkable. It's not least contained in Article 31 of the Vienna Convention, which provides that treaties should be interpreted in good faith and in accordance with their ordinary meaning. One of the, the authority we handed up this morning behind new tab 35, Sadi, sets out that approach. Um, the court be so kind as to turn to paragraph 61, page 448 of the report. The court in this case was dealing with, with a deportation case, so it's looking under a different limb of Article 51, 51F, but the principles are uh, universal, of universal application. So you see, at 61, the present case, the court is called upon for the first time to interpret the meaning of the words in F. In ascertaining the convention meaning of this phrase, it will, as always, be guided by Article 31 to 33 of Vienna. Under the Vienna Convention, the court is required to ascertain the ordinary meaning to be given to the words in their context, and in light of the object and purpose of the provision from which they are drawn, the court must have regard to the fact that the context of the provision is a treaty for the effective protection of individual human rights, and that the convention must be read as a whole and interpreted in such a way as to promote internal consistency and harmony between its various provisions. The court must also take into account any relevant rules and principles of international law applicable to the relationship between the contracting parties. And just pause there. Demonstrate, we say yet again, the relevance of the submissions for the interveners in this case. The court may also be had to the supplementary means of interpretation including the preparatory works of the convention, either to confirm a meaning determined in accordance with the above steps, or to establish the meaning where it would otherwise be ambiguous, obscure, absurd, or unreasonable. When considering the object and purpose of the provision within its context and the international law background, the court has regard to the importance of Article 5 in the convention system. It enshrines a fundamental right, namely the protection of individual against arbitrary interferences by the state with the right of liberty. So those are the rules, and therefore I turn to part four of six, which is applying them at the starting point, which is what's the literal interpretation of 5.1c, or the relevant clause, first limb of 5.1c. Does the authorization of detention affected for the purpose of bringing a person before the court 
mean that it needs to be the actual reason for depriving a person of their liberty? Or is it possible to authorise detention for some other unauthorised reason, so long as a person will in fact be brought before the court, whether voluntarily or involuntarily? Before you get to that part, and if that's premised on your interpretation of what the, the, that step in the judge's reasoning, could you just take us to the paragraph again that you say um, supports your interpretation of, of his reasoning in that context? Yes, and my lady, we, we, I know you've looked at it before, but just paragraph 43 yes. of his Lordship's judgment, um, which my lady will find at page 71 of the budget, Thank you. should really be read with 42 because it's responding to the submission advanced on behalf of the appellant. Yes. So my lady will see in paragraph 42, his lordship summarises the submissions on behalf of the appellant that the purpose for which the detention must be effected must be, is the reason, in essence. And his lordship reaches a different view to the reasons he gives in paragraph 43. Yes. But well, is... is I'm sorry to interrupt, Mr. Yes, so but is the final sentence of paragraph 42 an accurate summary of your argument? Yes, my lord. Because, um... Well, well the point there is not expressly mentioned. I, I'm so sorry, my lord. The, the point there is not expressly mentioned. Well, my, my lord, if, if my lord goes... Goes up a sentence. You'll, you, you, you'll see it, his lordship sets out as well established. Any detention must be effected for the purpose of bringing before the competent authority. So the argument below, as it is before this court, is that refers to the reason for detention. So our our, our case is the decision to deny bail can only be lawful, can only be compliant with Article Five if it is effected for the purpose of securing attendance before a court. And that wasn't the reason, obviously, why bail was denied in this case. Well, I, I, I understand the submission, but this is why I'm just asking whether it yes. is accurate to say that your argument was to the effect <coughs> that the um, absence of express mention is the decisive factor. As opposed to other, I'm so, I'm so sorry, my lord. I misunderstood your question. The the answer to that is there are reflections of each other. So there's a twin, there's a twin, that, 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 and they, and they, and it's necessary they work together. So affected for the affected for the purpose means what's the reason in our submission? What's the what's the active reason for the decision to deprive a person of their liberty? And here it was to detain a person in their, for their own protection, and that is not a permitted ground under Article 5.1. So they're two parts of the same argument, my Lord. All right. I hope that answers my Lord's question. Uh, thank you, yes. So that takes me back to, the, to, to, to really the kind of core of our, our core submission on this point, that the plain and natural meaning of the phrase effected for the purpose is directed squarely and unequivocally at the active reason for the detention. If you ask for what purpose was the detention effected, you are asking why the person was detained, for what reason. And that is obvious, we say, from the use of the word effective and the use of the word purpose which make plain in our submission that the active and greed, the active reason needs to be addressed to securing attendance at court. If you're right, this point <coughs> would also um, impinge on the alternative valid reason referred to in paragraph 60. It would, my lady. So I'm struggling, and was struggling at the time, with the extent of your concession um, it, there recorded. You didn't concede on your primary argument 
that detention for the second, under the second limb of Article 5.1c, would be compatible with Article 5 on the facts of this case? Oh, I'm so sorry. But if the second limb would be compatible. Yes. Because it would fall within. Understood. But Lourdes tells us, doesn't it, that there are two requirements in Article 5. Yes. The first is what we're looking at here. Yes. The purpose of. Yes. Your objection on the facts here would apply to both reasons, to the second limb, to detention under the second limb of Article 5.1c, wouldn't it? It would. The position I'm going to develop by reference to the authorities is that in respect to the second limb, there has been a considerable, there has been a degree of flexibility shown by the courts in this application. It's a more difficult, it's a more difficult position for you. It's a more difficult position. And it's not, and it's not, obviously not my case because this hasn't been. It's not the primary reason. But did you concede that all Article 5 arguments in relation to the, to detention under the second limb of Article 5? No. Paragraph 16, you suggest you did. The extent of any concession would be that detention for, to prevent harm to others is expressly provided for in the, in the second limb. All right. Okay. Thank you. We provided, I was just dealing with the meaning of purpose and effect. And we put, I hope helpfully, the relevant excerpts from the OED on those words behind tab 36, starting with effect first. We've sidelined the relevant entries. You say tab 30? 36, the hand up from this morning. Okay. So we have, first we have effect and we've, we've, we've highlighted the meaning there to bring about an event, to accomplish, and then in brackets, an intention, a desire. And then if we can just go on a few pages to, you then see the bottom right, one of 13, purpose. Over a couple of pages to three of 13, bottom right. Definition, the reason for which something is done or made, or for which it exists. The result or effect intended or sought. The end to which the object or action is directed. So in the appellant submissions, the ordinary meaning, as understood, is clear. It's affected for the purpose, means what it says. It's directed to the reason for the decision to deprive the individual of their liberty. In other words, a detention can only be justified when the reason for the deprivation is to bring the person before the court. That's the intent of the decision maker when denying bail. The question, for what reason am I being detained, must produce the same answer as the question, for what purposes are you detaining me? Completely unnatural, we submit, to conclude that those questions would bear different answers. And that obvious and natural meaning falls in complete harmony with the object and purpose of Article 5, which is to jealously guard the circumstances and carefully limit and circumscribe the circumstances in which it is lawful to deprive a person of their liberty. And it can only be done so when the reason and rationale for that is abundantly clear and in accordance with the express terms of Article 5.1. But the appellant's reading of purpose, I beg your pardon, the appellant's, that reading of the appellant's is also consistent with another element of Article 5, which is the protection against arbitrary detention. Because it's consistent with the requirement that the person who is detained understands the active reason for which they are detained. On the respondent's analysis, a detainee asking why they are being detained could get a different answer depending on their asking reason or purpose. What's the reason for my detention? What's the purpose of my detention? That makes no sense literally or schematically. And the unnatural for the respondent's arguments to have traction would require an unnatural use of the language. 
The primary reason for detention was protection for others. There has never been a suggestion that the reason for detention was to secure the appellant's uh, uh, attendance at court. Indeed, so issue I, I couldn't keep up. I'm so sorry, my lord. Repeat that. The unnatural use, in order for the respondent's arguments to be correct, you have to apply and adopt an unnatural use of the words purpose and effect, effected for a purpose. Yes, you said something that had never been argued. That's yeah, yes, yes. In this case, the primary reason was protection for others, and it has not been argued that the reason for detention was to secure attendance at court. Um, in, in, sorry, just, just in that regard, I'm, I'm sorry to keep interrupting, not at all, my lord. Uh, Herman, but it would just help me, certainly. If we just go back to the custody record, you <coughs> invited us to look at page 146 in the bundle, the entry of 1950. <clears throat> and you started reading it with reasons for refusing bail. But, but, but what do you say about the opening words of that entry? Is it aimed to appear at Bexley Youth Court the, the following morning? Yes. My, my lord, that needs to be read as a whole. And it needs to be re. It needs to be seen. It, it is separate on the page from the reasons that are given. And it needs to be read in the way that the defendant puts their case, which is the primary reason. And no suggestion in the pleaded case. So the defendant, having obviously some familiarity as to what this might mean on the case of the custody record, has not advanced a case that the reason was to secure attendance at the youth court the following day. So it's, it, it should simply be a statement of fact. They were detained and they will appear. But there is nothing in that custody record to suggest that that was the reason. And indeed, everything in the custody record suggests it wasn't the reason. It's not stated as the reason, and it's not put that way by the respondent. Well, what, um, if it was nothing to do with producing him at court the following morning, what was it? Was it a sort of benevolent or charitable? Well, that's no, my lord. That's my that's my point. It was it was because of a decision to exercise a power under Section Thirty Eight. So whether that's benevolent or for whatever reason it's put is irrelevant. But that was the basis in which it was done. It wasn't done to secure attendance, my lord. We can we can that so, we can. So, so you say that there can be a link. There can be an obvious link. There can be a temporal link. Um, that there, there would be appearance at court the next day. That doesn't answer the question of purpose. No, it doesn't matter. It it doesn't, and it it it's it's. It's sort of a net. It's a necessary factual background because you're, you you've been arrested on a reasonable suspicion, and the decision at the point of section thirty-eight bites is whether or not to detain or not to detain. So that's a necessary kind of factual antecedent fact, but it is not the reason. It is not being the decision to deny you liberty is not being affected for the purpose of securing your attendance at court, and his lordship faces up to that at paragraph forty-three of his judgment. This is on his lordship's analysis. Uh, 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 um, it matters not for that power to be exercised whether a person would otherwise be released on 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 bail or remanded. The power can still be exercised. So if we get if we go to paragraph forty three on page. It is. Yeah. That's the that is the nub of it. Because it matters not on this on the respondent's interpretation as applied by his lordship. It matters not whether uh, 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 the power to, to detain for own protection is independent of any need to secure attendance at court. The mere fact that somebody, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, will attend court does not bite upon the exercise of the power under Section 38. It is not being used to secure attendance. And that is a, a, a consistent with the statutory scheme. If we go, remember going back to the use of the word all, many of the other provisions in Section 38 are directed to making sure someone gets to court the next day. But this is not. This is independent of it. And his lordship, as one would 
uh, 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 well, entirely expect with absolute intellectual honesty takes the, uh, addresses that point head on. So to, 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 re, to return to my Lord, Lord Justice Holroyd's uh, 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 question, one cannot take that sentence in the custody record above giving the reasons as representing the reason, not how it's put, we would say, on a fair reading of the custody record. It's not how it's uh, 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 put in the pleadings by the defendant. And nor is that the way that which his lordship um, addressed it below, because his lordship tackled, as I say, absolutely head on the nature of the, uh, of the power. So this really does turn on what does affected for the purpose mean? What, what do you say about the analogy in paragraph 53? Well, uh, my lady, we, 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 we can retort back to that in, in, in our written submissions. And we say that ultimately, what that analogy does is deprive the phrase affected for a, pur affected for a purpose of its core ingredients, which is what, what it really means what's the justification for this detention? What's the reason for it? Because um, on, his, on, on his lordship's analysis, not only does affected for the purpose mean something other than what's the reason for it, what's the justification for it, it would also produce results we respectfully submit that are impossible to reconcile with the, 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 with the scheme. It would mean that so long as a person had, was going to be produced to a court, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, on reasonable suspicion of having committed an offence, then you can deprive them of their liberty for any reason. Subject to the protection against ar ar arbitrary detention, you can do it for any reason irrespective of whether those reasons fall within 518F or not. Now that cannot, we submit, be an interpretation that is consistent with the fundamental purpose. It's absolutely not consistent with the constant reframe in what is the clear and constant jurisprudence of the Strasbourg Court, that this list is exhaustive of the, of the times of, of the reasons for which you can deprive a person of a liberty and must be narrowly interpreted. Because it, 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 if I may, if that were true, if simply the mere fact, if Article 5.1c meant the mere fact that you were going to attend court meant that you were at liberty to de deny somebody, I beg your pardon, you were at liberty to deny somebody of their freedom on grounds uncontemplated by Article 5.1, it would be, if I may coin a phrase from Justice Scalia, it would be a, 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 a convention drafters hiding an elephant through a mouse hole. So drawing all, all that together, if I may, it's our submission that in order to justify a reading of 5.1c, that jars with its ordinary meaning is inconsistent with the fundamental purposes, both of the convention and the rules of interpretation, one would require the very clearest of authority from Strasbourg, a line of clear and constant jurisprudence, to justify such what is, it would be a radical departure, we say, from Article 5.1, case law. And that takes me then, if I may, to the, four, the fifth part of, of, of my submissions on grounds one and two, which is the flexible approach, which his lordship identifies at paragraph 44 of his judgment. Now, it's going to be necessary to just take you through some of that relevant case law to identify what the notion of flexibility means in the context of Article 5. Uh, where it has been applied, and importantly, where it has not been applied. But the, the headline points are really these. Strasbourg has shown a willingness to have to regard to what it describes as the realities of modern policing, 
in respect of the interpretation of Article 5.1 in two limited ways. Firstly, when considering the question as to whether or not... So, firstly, as to whether or not the detention amounted to a deprivation of liberty at all. Look at cases such as Austin in a minute. And secondly, in respect of a trend to recognise some degree of flexibility in respect of the second limb of 5.1c, preventative detention, particularly in the context of policing, football, hooligans, and potentially violent public protests. But when we look at the cases, I'll seek to argue that they, in fact, serve by way of contrast to illustrate the strength of the appellant's case, that there is no room for flexibility, no justification for flexibility, uh, in respect of the purpose clause as it applies to the first limb of 5.1. C. Can I start with lawless? Because its, it's application is central to uh, a number of cases that follow. As the court will recall, it's a case that concerns the detention without trial of a member of the IRA, who was purported to be justified under the second limb of preventative detention. Uh, uh, and the arguments of the Irish government was that that second limb did not need to be read together with the purpose requirement. So you, the purpose of preventative detention, it was said by Ireland, did not have to be affected for the purposes of bringing the individual before the court. We'll find uh, lawless at tab 14 of the authorities. And we'll see that the uh, 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 court made plain that the three limbs in Article 5.1c are separate, they exist independently of each other, and all require an intent to, to, to bring before the court. We can, we can see that if we um, pick up the judgment at paragraph 13. Sorry, it, it's not that they require an intent to bring before the court, they require detention for the purpose. Well, he's absolutely right. I'm afraid that was slightly aspirational <laughs> uh, reading in from me. Uh, um, so if we could pick it up at 292, paragraph 13. Uh, the court says, the question referred to the judgment of the court is whether or not the provisions of 5.1c and 3 prescribe that a person arrested or detained when reasonably considered necessary to prevent committing offence shall be brought before a judge. In other words, whether in Article 5.1c the expression affected for the purpose of bringing him before the competent judicial authority qualifies only the words on reasonable suspicion of committing an offence, first limb, or also the words when it's reasonably considered necessary to prevent his committing an offence, second limb. And um, applying the first rule of interpretation, the Strasbourg, which is what's the plain and natural reading of the words, the court reads, uh, uh, reaches a clear conclusion at 14 that the wording of Article 5.1c is sufficiently clear to give an answer to this question. It is evident that the expression affected for the purpose of bringing him before the competent legal authority qualifies every category of arrest or detention referred to in that subparagraph. It follows the said clause permits the deprivation of liberty only when such a deprivation is affected for the purpose of bringing the arrested or detained before the competent judicial authority, irrespective of whether such a person is a person who reasonably suspected of committing an offence or preventative detention. And then um, you can just see, if I can just identify two more uh, 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 exits on this page. Firstly, facing page 293, first full paragraph, you can just see that it's a grammatical analysis that's been applied by the court to reach that conclusion. So it's not not taking, uh, 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 it's not looking at the effect, it's not looking at the public policy ramifications, it's just looking at the grammatical meaning. 
and then next paragraph down, having ascertained that the text of 5.1c and 3 is sufficiently clear in itself, uh, 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 and means, on the one hand, that every person who's reasonably considered necessary to prevent committing offence may be arrested or detained only, and we give some emphasis to only, for the purpose of bringing before the competent legal authority, uh, 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 and on the other hand, arrested and detained be brought before a judge under 5.3. So this is, um, this is a, a case I take you to at the beginning because of the disarticulation of the three, of the, of the three limbs of 5.1c. But it's an important grounding when we come to look at some of the subsequent cases. The case I take you to because of the nature of the analysis applied by the Strasbourg Court, which is firstly just starting off with a literal interpretation. If that's good enough, that's the end of the matter. It's also an, an interesting case in the context of some of the submissions that I face, which are essentially amount to public policy reasons for interpreting uh, 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 Article 51C. But this, like many cases in Strasbourg, is a case in which there were very compelling reasons why you would want to have a power to have preventative detention of the nature applied by Ireland. And it's one of a series of cases dealing with terrorism, with dealing with very serious crime, in which there have been compelling reasons to mould the convention, but unless justified on the text, the court has held firm. And you can get a sense of it here if you go to page 284 of the type of individual that Mr. Lawless was, and the type of rationale you may think would bear upon a need for some degree of preventative detention. He's, he, he's first arrested with a load of weaponry. He admits to being a member um, of the um, IRA. He's uh, 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 coming down a paragraph. He's arrested again. He's found with a sketch map for an attack. He bore the inscription, infiltrate, annihilate, and destroy. Um, on searching his house, the police found a manuscript document on guerrilla warfare revealing the purposes to be attacked on British property and the, British, and the killing of British officials and others. Not enough. Not a basis in itself. S -s Similar situation faced the Strasbourg Court more recently in the case of Medivh, which my um, learned friend Ms. Gallagher uh, uh, um, deals with. People caught red-handed with drugs. Heroin being brought into Europe. Not enough to bend Article 5. Bottom of page 292, um, different context. Will you come back to that in ground six? Because uh, the judge below um, drew on this, and as I understand it, you don't accept how he interprets this sentence. That's right. Is that be ground six? That's ground six, yes. Could I turn then away from um, Strasbourg for a moment to the domestic courts? Because the first case that the respondent relies upon for uh, what it contends is a flexible approach applicable to the first limb of 5.1c is the case of Austin before the House of Lords, which the court will find behind tab 8. Uh, Austin concerned the tactic of kettling whereby a large group of protesters in Oxford Circus were uh, 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 constrained, uh, encircled uh, on the streets. Some of those protesters were um, violent. And the issue before both the domestic and the Strasbourg courts wasn't the nature, wasn't the contents of the Article 5 rights, but rather whether Article 5 was engaged at all. Uh, 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 um, and the debate turns on whether or not this was a deprivation of liberty. Now, the respondent contends, for your note, paragraph 2.3, Roman numeral 1 of her skeleton, that it would be illogical if the court in Austin were allowed to take into account the underlying purpose of detention for determining whether this was a deprivation of liberty, but illogical if it was then to be ignored when assessing the contents of the rights if it is a deprivation of liberty. That's so illogical, they say. But in fact, as I'm going to see to show you, Austin serves to reinforce that once you are within the confines of Article 5, there is little room for flexibility. And indeed, that is one of the rationales for a broader, more flexible approach to the question as to whether it's a deprivation of liberty at all. The 
can see the issue uh, before the appellate committee if we turn to um, paragraph 2 in the leading judgment of Lord Hope, which is at page 121. So the ways in which the police will seek to control the event will vary. In this case, their policy was one of containment. And we can see that its consequences of a large number of people were enclosed. They were prevented from many hours for leaving. Article 5.1 provides no one should be deprived of liberty save in the cases which that article specifies. The appellant was one of those in the police cordon. The question which this case raises is whether the way in which she was treated was incompatible with her conventional right to liberty. Underlying that question is an important issue of principle. The right which is guaranteed by 5.1 is an absolute right, but it first must first be held to be applicable. To what extent, if at all, is it permissible in the determination of that issue to balance the interests of the individual against the demands of the general interests of the community. Let's focus that balancing exercise is relevant to the question of deprivation, whether there's a deprivation of liberty at all, not as to the contents of the right there is. And that's the context in which uh, 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 um, Lord Hope analysed the question. And we can pick it up uh, 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 at paragraph 34, page 132 of the bundle. His Lordship said, I would hold, that, therefore, that there is room, even in the case of fundamental rights, as to whose application no restriction or limitation is permitted by the Convention, for a pragmatic approach to be taken, which takes full account of the circumstances. Now, it's important not to take that out of context, uh, 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 because we need to see what that question was. No reference is made in Article 5 to the interest of public safety or the protection of public order as one of the cases in which a person may be deprived of liberty. This is in sharp contrast to Article 10.2 which expressly qualifies the right of freedom to expression in these respects. But the importance that must be attached in the context of Article 5 to measures taken in the interest of public safety is indicated by Article 2 of the Convention, as the lives affected by mob violence may be at risk if measures of crowd control cannot be adopted by the police. This is a situation where a search for a fair balance is necessary if these competing fundamental rights be reconciled with each other. <coughs> the ambit that is given to Article 5 as to measures of crowd control must course, take into account the rights of the individual and the interests of the community. So any steps that must be that to take it must be resorted to in good faith and must be proportionate to the situation which has made the measures necessary. This is essential to preserve the fundamental principle that anything that is done which affects the person's right to liberty must not be arbitrary. If this requirements are met, however, it would be proper to conclude that measures of crowd control that are undertaken in the interests of the community will not infringe the Article 5 rights of individual members of the crowd whose freedom of movement is restricted by them. And I'll go on to see in a moment. Again, it's worth just emphasising that is not because the court is, is reinterpreting the contents of the Article 5 rights. It's just addressing itself to the question as to whether or not they're engaged at all. And we can see that because um, his lordship then goes on at the bottom of that page, two lines up, to consider the uh, 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 Metropolitan Commissioner's alternative submission that uh, if Article 5.1 was engaged, if Article 5 was engaged, <coughs> that it could be justified under 5.1c because they reasonably believed it was necessary to prevent her committing a common law offence of refusing to aid a constable. Now that would be, that, that does fall within the second limb, but it wasn't available to the commissioner in this case because of lawless, because there was no, it wasn't effective for the purposes of bringing it before the court. And counsel or the commissioner accepted that to develop that argument, uh, he would need to show that Lawless was wrong. And then we get a, 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 a further at 36. We know that Lord, the, the, the counsel for the commissioner didn't advance that argument in oral arguments um, before the court, and the, this court found it unnecessary to reach a concluded view. But Lord Hope said it would be most unfortunate if the police would have to rely on these set paragraphs, or either of them, when they were considering whether or not it was lawful for them to resort to measures of crowd control. It's obvious that neither of them was designed with that way of preserving public order in mind. It's safe to assume that if they had thought that such measures were at risk of being held within the ambit of 5.1, the framers of the convention would have used language similar to that which is found in 10.2. 
as it is the tests which they lay down, which must be construed strictly, are highly specific to the position of the individual whose right to liberty is guaranteed by that article. They refer to what the court has described as the concrete situation of the person who complains that his right to liberty has been violated. It just sets out what that would mean to the police in that scenario. And at 37, his lordship says, if measures this kind are to be avoided, being prohibited by the convention, it must be by recognising they are not within the ambit of Article 5 one at all. So, so if I'm looking at paragraph 34, and you say you can see the context of that by reference to 35 and 26, I just wonder if you go back to paragraph 26 and to 29. But paragraph 34 is the concluding paragraph under the question, is purpose relevant? And the purpose in question is whether, well, the question is whether or not purpose is a relevant consideration when looking at whether or not you're within a, within the ambit of 5.1 at all. Yes, my lady. That, that, is that not a clearer demonstration of your point? I, I, if you see what I mean. It is. Um, so that's what, and, and, and the Lord Hope is then going through the cases that deal with that question, and that's his conclusion at the end of that exercise. Yes. Um, my, my lady, I take, I take you to 36, though, mm -hmm. because one can see that, that core part of the rationale of Lord Hope is that the reason that one might think there should be flexibility is the question as to whether or not Article 5 one is engaged at all in, the, in, in situations of public protest, whether that deals with Article 5. Part of the reasoning is, once, you, once it is in Article 5c, you're in, you're, it's going to be unlawful. But of course, it's dealing with the second limb, and here we are dealing which is, so his lordship is saying, these issues of public protest, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't have envisaged, the framers would not have envisaged that this would fall within the scope of Article 5. And the, the same cannot be said for detention in a police cell. Can I just show you to the same effect, Lord Walker, uh, at paragraph 44. <coughs> uh, the purpose of confinement, which may arguably amount to deprivation of liberty, is in general relevant, not to whether the threshold is crossed, but to whether that confinement can be justified under 51A to C. If confinement... Uh, uh, after the cases, if confinement amounting to deprivation of liberty and personal security is established, good intentions cannot make up for any deficiencies in the justification for the confinement under one of the exceptions listed, which are to be strictly construed. And then Lord Newberger, Power 64. His Lordship says it's worth bearing in mind that at least as I see it, if the restraint in the present case did amount to detention within Article 5, it would not be possible for the police to justify the detention under the exceptions in B or C, not least because of the reasoning in lawless. I consider that the fact... Did you say paragraph 64? 64, my lady, yes, on page 139. I consider the fact that the restraint in the present case could not be justified under any of the exceptions A to F supports the contention that the constraint didn't amount to detention within Article 5 at all. It would appear to me very odd if it would be not, if it were not to be open to the police to act as they did in the instant circumstances without infringing the Article Five rights of those who were constrained. Austin went to Strasbourg. We'll find that at tab nineteen. They endorsed the approach uh, of the House of Lords, albeit stressing that the facts in that case were uh, 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 um, exceptional. You can just for your note, you can see the conclusion reached, paragraph 67, page 456. But it is in the Strasbourg judgment, the reference, we have seized again a reference to modern policing and the need for the court to have regard to modern policing when addressing certain questions under uh, Article 5. And we can see that comment at paragraph 56 page 453. As the court has previously stated, 
the police must be afforded a degree of discretion in taking operational decisions. Such decisions are almost always complicated. And the police, who have access to information intelligence not available to the general public, will used to be in the best position to make them. Uh, by 2001, advances in communication technology had made it possible to mobilize protesters rapidly and convertly on a hitherto unknown scale. Police forces face new challenges, etc. And then this, Article 5, cannot be interpreted in such a way as to make it impractical for the police to fulfill their duties of maintaining order and protecting the public, provided they comply with the underlying principle of Article 5, which is to protect the individual from arbitrariness. But that is not to be taken to submit as the identification of a new general rule of interpretation, permitting expansive interpretation across the board in Article 5, but it is directed to the more limited question as to whether or not Article 5 was engaged at all. And we can see that from uh, 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 um, two, through two sources. One, the judgment itself, which reminds us of the limited role, uh, uh, limited scope within Article 5 for interpretation. We'll see that if we turn on to paragraph uh, I beg your pardon, if we can turn back to paragraph 53. As the court's underlined on many occasions, it's a living the convention's a living instrument must be interpreted in light of present day conditions. This does not, however, mean that, uh, that to respond to present day needs, conditions, views, or standards, the court can create a new right apart from those recognized by the convention, or that it can whittle down an existing right or create new exceptional justification, which is not expressly recognized in the convention. And then at 60, we can see, the uh, uh, again, the repetition of the well-known centrality of Article 5 to the human rights scheme. Exhaustive list, uh, 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 um, narrow interpretation. And if you want a further uh, 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 um, reassurance that paragraph 56 is not providing a general rule of interpretation across the board, you can see at the bottom of that paragraph of 56, the footnote to Sadi, paragraph 67 to 74. I won't, because of time, take you back to that, but we've sidelined those passages, and it's absolutely obvious that there is no, there's no hint in those paragraphs in Sadi of a general, a new general approach to interpreting convention rights. So the summary point at this stage along the timeline is that there's been no flexibility offered by Strasbourg or the House of Lords in respect of interpreting the contents of rights under Article 5.1. Indeed, much of that jurisprudence we see is motivated by the lack of flexibility in respect to the contents of those rights. Now, the next case, if I may, relied on by the respondent and identified by the judge is Ostendorf, which you'll find at tab 20 of the authorities over the, over the page. <laughs> it's a case in which uh, a person identified as the leader of a violent group of football hooligans was held for about four hours uh, by the German police when he tried to peel off from police surveillance of his gang. Indeed, he was arrested in the cubicle of a pub in a lady's a cubicle of a lady's toilet in Frankfurt. And as with Lawless and Austin, this is a second limb of 5-1-C case. It's a preventative detention case. And it's also a case we now know in which the court took a wrong turn and held contrary to Lawless that preventative detention under the second limb needs to be read with the first limb, i.e. you can only be detained to prevent future offences if you are already suspected of having committed an offence. I take you to this authority because it is cited by the judge at paragraph 44 as support for the flexible approach. But caution is needed because, as we will see, the court reaches, the court at paragraph 88, if we just quickly turn to it, refers to the need uh, 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 to interpret Article 5 in a way to make it, to not make it impractical for the police to fulfill their duties. It recognised the particular importance within the German legal system at 88 of deprivation of liberty. It sets out those principles, but then as you see at 89, notwithstanding those principles, it says it can't, it can't shift.
just for your note, with just sidebarring <coughs> paragraph 87 as well, where the court deals with the interrelationship between Article 5 and Articles 2 and 3 of the Convention, and notes at the bottom that the state's positive obligations under different Convention articles do not, therefore, as such, warrant a different or wider interpretation of the permissible grounds for the deprivation of liberty uh, exhaustively listed in Article 5.1. But this isn't a case about the application of a flexible approach. Next case is Hicks, which my lady and my lord will find at um, tab 12. Uh, this is the preventive detention of protest people protesting against the uh, royal wedding. They were detained between about two and a half and five and a half hours and released once the wedding was over, say before any production of court. Worth just reading the head note to see how it was dealt with below. Uh, the, the facts are set out in the first few sentences. Um, they are detained, arrested in central London, detained for between two and a half and five and a half hours. But once the wedding was over, and the police considered that the risk of a breach of the peace had passed, they were released without charge, without having been brought before the magistrate's court. The claimants brought JR proceedings on the grounds that detention had breached their right to liberty. The divisional court dismissed the claim on the grounds that the detention of each claimant had been reasonably considered necessary to prevent his committing an offence within 5.1c, holding, and then this is important, that it was not necessary that such preventative detention also be effected for the purpose of bringing the detainee before the competent legal authority within Article 5.1c. The Court of Appeal dismissed the claimant's appeal, holding that for the purposes of 5.1c, a preventative detention was required to have been effected for the purpose of bringing the detainee before the court, but that the requirements had been satisfied because the arresting officers would have taken the claimant to the magistrate's court if it had become necessary to continue their detention beyond the point in time when it became reasonably practical to do so. So this court reaffirmed the need that the purpose of detention has to be to effect before the court to bring before the secure attendance before the court. The issue before the House of Lords is whether that purpose can be, that requirement can be satisfied where in fact a person is released before they are brought before the court. Uh, and as we can see, the, uh, 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 I beg your pardon, the Supreme Court uh, unanimously said um, it could. The um, judgment of the court is given by Lord Toulson, with whom all the other members agree. Um, if we could pick it up, please, from paragraph um, 29. His Lordship starts his analysis at 29, again discussing the need to have regard to the realities of policing. Article 5 must not be interpreted in such a way as to make it impractical for the police to perform their duties to maintain public order, and to protect lives and property of others. And his lordship says at 30, in balancing these twin considerations, it's necessary to keep a grasp of reality and the practical implications. Indeed, this is central to the principle of proportionality, which is not only embedded in Article 5, but as part of the common law. Um, again, it's important to be clear as to what his lordship is addressing with these comments. So the issue that his lordship is addressing here is the question of the protection against arbitrary detention. See that from the very first sentence of paragraph 29. The fundamental principle is the need to protect the individual from arbitrary detention. An essential part of that is timely judicial control. So that's where the analysis about the need for flexibility. But we see that it's a different question and different considerations apply when we turn to paragraph 32. Because his lordship says there is, however, a difficult question of law as to how, much, how such preventative power can be accommodated within Article 5. The Strasbourg case law is not settled, is not clear and settled, and there's an evident division between the majority and the minority in Ostendorf. And there's a judicial choice to be made. So the preceding paragraphs 
are about when, as one would expect when one is dealing with a more diffuse notion of what is arbitrary and what is proportionate, in which it is possible to take into account a range of factors, and as the Supreme Court says, including the realities of modern policing. But when you come to the strictures of Article 5.1, here Article 5.1c, second limb, it's a much more restricted analysis. And to that question, his lordship applies a more traditional approach. Starting at paragraph 34 with a linguistic analysis. His lordship says, I agree with the administration court. Fits more, the situation fits more naturally within the language of 5.1c than b. Thirty-six, analysing the arguments within the context of the existing case law, <clears throat> and uh, concluding within th th thirty-six that the lawless line of analysis accords with common sense for the reasons that it would be given. I mean, it would be perverse if you detain somebody on preventative grounds for the purposes of affecting their production before court. But then have to, those, the basis for that, the rationale for that, disappears. But somehow, you still have to keep them in custody to comply with the article. That would be, as, 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 as his lordship said, perverse. And so that's why at 38, his lordship reached the conclusion he does. He, he, in order to make coherent sense and achieve the fundamental purpose, he'd, his lordship said, I would read the qualification of the power of arrest or detention contained in the words, for the purpose of bringing him before the competent legal authority, as implicitly dependent on the cause for detention continuing long enough for the person to be brought before the court. So he therefore agrees with the minority in Austin's office. I'm going to make just two observations about the case. Firstly, you can see it's the traditional rules of interpretation are being applied. To, to, to what does 5.1c mean? They're not being developed by broad notions of flexibility what could generally be called public policy considerations. That's confined to the more traditional role of, of a portionality assessment. And secondly, there is nothing in this judgment that questions for one moment that the purpose for which a detention is affected uh, 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 can be justified on anything other than an express ground within 5.1, 5.1c. There was no dispute in that case second limb was, was engaged. It was detention. It was preventative detention, which is expressly allowed. And it was for that purpose. It was affected for the purpose of securing attendance before the court. Just that purpose no longer existed shortly after, not a few hours after the arrest. And where do we find that uh, in the facts? I'm that it was for the purpose that the point of detention was for the purpose of bringing before the court. Well, that's that's. Uh, forgive me if I don't. I'm not sure that is expressly set out, but it is. It, it's it's absolutely implicit in the language because that's the that's what the court's addressing here. The I, court is, I understand. The yes, fact. I'm so sorry, my lady. I'm so sorry. There's not a. Unfortunately, I think I'll be correct if I'm wrong, but I don't think there is a, a nice crisp. Um, passage, but it, that, that is, as my lady obviously knows, that's, 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 that's the point. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be discourteous. Could I <coughs> then finally move to S and Denmark, which is the last case that's relied upon uh, 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 for displaying um, flexibility? And indeed, it does um, display a greater degree of flexibility than in pre to the application of Article 5.1c than other cases. But as I'll seek to show, it is carefully confined in ways that are of no wider application to the second limb. So the um, court will find um, Denmark behind tab 24. The facts you can get just from the head note, it's another uh, it's another hooligan case. Um, 
they are uh, applicants are detained by the police prior to the commencement of a football match. The detention was part of a police strategy based on intelligence, suggested there'd be violent clashes. Uh, they detained 138 spectators, half of those charged with criminal offences, other half being detained to prevent a breach of the peace. Three applicants were detained on the latter basis, so were in the second limb. Uh, and they were detained based on intelligence suggesting they had incited others to fight with opposition um, fans. So this is a case in which there's a return to lawless in terms of um, the orthodoxy that the three limbs in 5.1c are to be disarticulated. So you don't, so preventative detention does not have to be part of uh, a criminal proceedings. And we can see the particular issues before the court if we turn to paragraph 96. Page 702. The crucial question, well, in fact, we should read 95. So it's endeavouring to interpret and apply the convention in a manner taking proper account of the challenges identified. Those are the policing difficulties faced. Whilst maintaining the effective protection of human rights, the court will take this opportunity to examine whether there's a need for clarification of its case law uh, under uh, C of 5. One, the crucial question to answer in this respect is whether the words, when it's reasonably considered necessary to prevent his committing an offence, the second limb, ought to be seen as a distinct ground for deprivation of liberty independent of the existence of a reasonable suspicion of him having committed an offence the first limb. And then there's a three-step process that the court carries out. First, review how the second limb has been interpreted and applied. Secondly, you consider whether the purpose requirement entails any particular obstacles to applying the second limb of 5.1c to preventative detention. Thirdly, provided that preventative detention can fall with, under the second limb of 1c, the court will assess how the additional safeguards contained in 3 and 5 should apply to ensure that such detention is not arbitrary or disproportionate. Now, as to the first question, which essentially is whether they should follow Ostendorf or Lawless, over the following paragraphs, the court carries out a fairly traditional analysis, again looking at the text, looking at the, text, looking at the cases, and reaches a uh, conclusion at paragraph 114 uh, uh, to 116, and concludes that against the background it's set out, there are weighty arguments in favour of espousing the interpretation adopted in lawless and reflected in a number of rules thereafter that 5.1c contemplates the detention of a person in distinct circumstances. Notes at 115, the interpretation was not adhered to in several later judgments, from Quiller to Ostendorf. Um, however, it has been explained that approach not only represented a stark and unacknowledged departure from lawless, it's also difficult to reconcile with the textual interpretation in the latter, supported by the preparatory work, as well as with a number of rulings delivered both before and after Quila. And it's only at this point that we then get to the wider language uh, about policy. The court is therefore of the general view that in order not to make it impractical for the police to fulfill their duties of maintaining order and protecting the public, provided they are comply with the underlying principles of Article 5, uh, uh, um, the, to, which is to protect the individual from arbitrariness, the lawful detention of a person outside the context of criminal proceedings uh, can, as a matter of principle, be permissible under 5.1c. Uh, and they say when it would be justified in, in the paragraphs below. So that's the first question. So it's a return to the orthodoxy of lawless with three really disarticulated grant limbs. Uh, 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 court then goes to whether the purpose requirement may constitute an obstacle to preventative detention uh, under the second what paragraph the, 118 my lady you've got the, the, the heading just above it so this is essentially the Hicks question and we can see um, a, 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 again at 118 the notion of flexibility but in relation to this Hicks question so um, court stated in lawless that the purpose requirement of Article 5.1c applies to all categories of cases referred to in this subparagraph. It should be noted that the court has recognised in other cases that this requirement is to be interpreted and applied 
with a certain flexibility when the intention that once existed of bringing the applicant before the competent legal authority does not materialize for some reason. The fact that an arrested person was neither charged nor before, before the charge doesn't necessarily mean that the purpose of his intention was not in accordance with Article 5.1c. Uh, the, the, suggest that, although not now because of time, that the remainder of those passages uh, through to 127 uh, are um, uh, 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 read in full. There are passages, not least paragraph 121, in which the court, in respect of the second limb, deploys a more wide-reaching analysis than certainly the Supreme Court did um, in Hicks. But it reaches the same conclusion as in Hicks, uh, which you will see at paragraphs 122 to 123 and 126. And the conclusion at 126 is subject to the availability under the national law of additional safeguards in Article 5.3 and 5.5. The court considers that when a person is released from preventative detention after a short period of time, either because the risk has passed or, for example, because a prescribed short period of time has expired, the purpose requirement of bringing a detainee before the competent uh, legal authority should not constitute an obstacle to short-term preventative detention falling under the second limb. So as, as uh, uh, the approach adopted in Brogan should be interpreted and implied in recognition of the need to deal specifically with such serious challenges are as issue in this case. Now, I accept that's, 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 that, is, that is certainly in language going further than any of the authorities had gone to at that point, both Strasbourg and the House of Lords and Supreme Court. But it is doing so in the context of the second limb. And can I just make a few observations drawing all these cases together, not least S in Denmark? In every case, when uh, considering Article 5, including S in Denmark in this citation I took you to at the beginning of my submissions, both Strasbourg and the domestic courts have been at pains to point out that whatever flexibility they may show in approach, the enumerated grounds of detention in Article 5.1 are exhaustive. And you, there is no case in which a reason not specified in Article 5.1, including in Article 5.1c, has been held to be compliant with the Convention. Sorry, can you repeat that last sentence? There, there, in, 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 so sorry. I've, there's no case in which... Oh, yes. Yeah, there, there is no case in which a Strasbourg court or a domestic court has identified the reason for detention as being compliant with Article 5 when the reason for detention is not one set out in A to F. So all the cases we just looked at are where the reason for detention was to affect, was, was for the purpose of affecting securance before the court in the preventative detention context. Secondly, the approach to assessing the nature and those contents of the right, including what affected for a purpose means, in all the cases, has been through traditional rules of interpretation, starting with the natural and ordinary meaning of those words. Thirdly, the only aspect of Article 5.1c that has been subject to a flexible reading is the second limb. And that is only in S and Denmark. And S and Denmark uh, ha ha has, it's a recent case, so this may not be a telling point, but has never been applied outside of this case as authority that supports a proposition for a flexible approach to the first limb of Article 5.1. But if you can have a flexible approach to the second limb, why can't you have a flexible approach to 
I'm good. Can I, can I just come to that? That's my, 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 my very next point, my lady. I just wanted to show you how it's been treated, certainly by Strasbourg, this case. It's very much a case to do with the second link. And can I just show you in tab 34, right at the back of the authorities bundle, which is the um, court's guide to Article 5. This is not an authority. It's um, updated, you can see, from the first page uh, on the, at the end of last year, at the very end of last year. If you turn over the page to 942, you can see the, the provenance of the guide. You can see just towards the bottom, it's been prepared under the authority of Juris Consult and doesn't bind the court. Um, so it's for your note, Juris Consult is appointed by Rule 18b of the Rules of Court of Strasbourg. And its mandate is to assist the court in maintaining the quality and consistency of the case law. It provides opinion and information <coughs> to the court. And we can see at paragraph uh, 78 to 83, 941. No, I, that's going to be a pardon, that is not the correct page reference. It's 952. Uh, paragraph 78 deals with the purpose of arrest or detention. 78, effective for the purpose of bringing before the legal authority, qualifies all three bases. We're returning to lawless. 82, just over the top of the next page, the existence of the purpose to bring a suspect before the court has to be considered independently of the achievement of that purpose. The standard imposed by 51C does not presuppose the police have sufficient evidence to bring charges at the time of arrest whilst the applicant was in custody. The object of questioning during detention under 5C is to further the criminal investigation by way of confirming or dispelling the concrete suspicion grounding the arrest. The purpose requirement at 83, this is where we get to Denmark, the purpose requirement of bringing a detainee before the court is to be applied with a degree of flexibility to detention falling under the second limb in order not to prolong a necessarily short preventative detention. When a person is released from preventative detention after a short period of time, either because the risk has passed or, for example, because the prescribed short time period is uh, As expired. you acknowledge, I think, Mr. Hammer, the, um, this is, a, Hammer, this is a, um, an analysis of the case law which you've already referred us to. It is, but what it is, my lady, is post-S in Denmark, an analysis by an organ of the court, which is doing that which we say is the natural reading in any event of S in Denmark, which is that it is a case limited to the second limb. I can turn now to why, my fourth point, drawing it together, which is why that must be right. In the whole series of cases that we have seen on the second limb, preventative detention, whether it's um, violent protesters in Oxford Circus, hooligans on the streets of Germany, the courts have consistently identified how the needs of modern policing need to be taken into account in a range of different questions. Now, initially, along the timeline, the courts have been reluctant to consider whether it should impact upon Article 5.1 at all, and only in very recent times have they held that it could in respect of the second limb. But every time they do it with the second limb, they do two things. Firstly, they identify cogent reasons for that flexible approach. And secondly, they demonstrate how that rationale is so core to the purpose of preventative detention. As, as Germany were unsuccessfully arguing in Ostendorf, Denmark more successfully, you, you, we can't, we can't, the convention can't operate if we can't have preventative measures to stop hooligans running amok down Frankfurt Street unless, we've committed, unless they've already committed a crime or on a reasonable suspicion have already committed a crime. We can't function as a police force protecting the public. 
But no such policy requirement bear upon the first limb. The principles identified by Strasbourg, justifying some flexibility under the second limb, it is because of the requirement to maintain all public order and to protect the public. Now, those aren't present here. The protection of a young young child? Yes, it's not protecting the public. That's protecting the public. I'm going to look at the flip side in, in a moment. But the actual rationale adopted by the Strasbourg Court of maintaining public order and protecting the public are not the justifications. There may be different justifications, I'm going to turn to in a moment, but they are not the justifications that would permit, if a flexible reading is permissible, it's not on those grounds. Now, of course, we accept there is a public interest in protecting individuals from harm, a fortiori children. Uh, uh, the judge was right to emphasize that at paragraph 48 in the way that he did. But it is far more complicated and nuanced than the public interest in protecting the public from hooligans marauding down the public highway. There is a vital counterbalance here of, of, of personal autonomy, which underpins many aspects of human rights law, not just the protection of liberty. It's more nuanced still in respect of minors. Because as the interveners point out, those protections are already provided for in other ways, not least with the child protection statutory framework. N no doubt the police would wish to warn individuals of risks to them if they step outside the police station. They might try and accommodate those people voluntarily within the police station to help them. They would no doubt take all reasonable steps to protect them. But depriving a person of their liberty when they want freedom and would otherwise be entitled to it it is impossible, we submit, to shoehorn into the terms of Article 5.1c and to that first limb. So, with great respect, we say when we look back on these cases, we can see that the conclusion arrived at by, by his lordship actually amounts to a radical extension of the jurisprudence. First time in respect of the first limb for the reasons that I've given an unprincipled extension into new territory that in fact is not only inconsistent with the language but inconsistent with the fundamental principle of personal autonomy. Now, can I just ask, of course, Mr. Hamill, what do you say Sergeant Smith should have done? Would my Lord forgive me I deal with that in ground three because I'm going to do. I, I, I mean, I can answer it in short term now. Please. First of all, he should have spoken to the local authority, right. uh, 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 who were under a statutory obligation to provide accommodation. Now, he might. He should have assessed whether or not the accommodation that the local authority was going to offer was suitable. But that should have been step number one. Um, we know he should have made inquiries as to what his position was at home and whether or not, in fact, it would be. Uh, 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 dangerous for him to return to home. He, this is an arrest five days after. This is an arrest five days after the incident, with no suggestion of a violent attack on his home in the meantime. We know that he has later bailed to his aunt. Why didn't somebody ask him? Uh, 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 um, is there anybody else you can go and stay with? What he shouldn't have done is locked him up overnight in a police cell. Thank you. Can I deal then with the with the fifth penultimate uh, uh, um, part of my submissions, which is the Article Five Three cases, which is lordship um, placed reliance on? And we can see that between paragraphs forty six and seven of his judgment. So it's the case of I A against France and Bazaji against Moldova. Um, headline point is we say they throw no light at all on the meaning and effect of Article Five One, and in particular tell us nothing about what affected for the purpose means. And we note that the, my little friend puts it no higher in his skeleton than suggesting that these authorities offer some limited support uh, uh, for uh, his case. And we say they are actually wholly irrelevant. It's worth starting, if I may, with the text, going back to the text of Article 5 and looking at 5.1 in relation to 5.3. 
And we say that falls down actually when you just look at the, 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 the structure of 5-1 in, in relation to 5-3. So we're, we're tab 1. Um, so you can see that 5-3 only operates through the prism of 5-1 C. And of course, in that, to that degree, they are red of 1. It's an additional layer of protection that's provided in 5-3. Uh, uh, um, that you're put before um, a court. So they're read as a whole, but it's absolutely clear from the language and the structure that 5.3 is parasitic on 5.1. Uh, 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 um, and 5.3 assumes, get to 5.3, it assumes that there has been compliance with Article 5.1. And we'll see from the cases that they all, they all proceed, proceed on that basis, unsurprisingly. So it would be, we say, surprising as a matter of principle, if cases that look at this secondary limb, this parasitic limb, particularly because they deal with the length of the tension, they are not dealing with the underlying legality of the tension, it would be surprising if you could grab a principle from a 5-3 case that justifies the length of detention, and somehow that's transmuted into a lawful basis for detention, even though it's not specified in 5-1. That doesn't make sense. In all our researches, and I think one could take it for all the parties before the court, we have been um, unable to find any case under Article 5.1 that even hints that, but by reference to 5.1, that own protection is a, is, a, is a lawful ground to detain. There's nothing. Now, IA doesn't concern Article 5.1 at all. It's all about whether a five-year pre-trial detention in France on suspicion of murder was a reasonable period of time. Um, we can um, find that case at tab 15. Um, the uh, applicant, over the course of five years, uh, had been remanded into detention on 57 different occasions. And over that period, on 19 of those, the grounds for continued detention, the authorised grounds, included the, his own protection. But that was never the sole ground on which uh, further detention was authorised. You can see the nature of the issue before the Strasbourg Court if we turn to paragraph 94. So we can see that it is um, a complaint under 5.3 about the length of detention, not the underlying legality. One look, I won't take you to now, but if you look at the you look at the underlying facts, there was little doubt that 5-1 uh, was justified uh, for initial um, detention. Uh, um, we can see the assessments of the, uh, um, I beg your pardon, if we turn to 99, we can see the analysis of reasonableness of the length of detention. It's the only issue that's considered under Article 5. We can see that at paragraph 99 and following. The conclusions uh, of are at the court are reached at paragraph 102. Uh, uh, which is that, and we see the second paragraph, the persistence of reasonable suspicion that the person arrested has committed an offence, a point at which was not contested in the present case is a condition sine qua non for the validity of the continued detention. Uh, 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 but after a certain lapse of time, it no longer suffices. And we can see there's an assessment of the, di of the various different grounds on which um, detention was authorised, including at paragraph 108, 
protection, uh, 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 his own protection, court accepts in some cases safety of a person under investigation requires his continued investigation for a time at least can only do so in exceptional circumstances having to do with the nature of the offences concerned, the conditions in which they were committed and the context in which they took place. And then there's the history of the remand on those grounds set out over the um, following page and a conclusion reached at 111 that five years was not a reasonable period and there was a breach therefore of Article 5.3. So if I can just make um, four short observations, this is a case that has nothing to do with 5.1. The procedure has been complied with. Secondly, flowing from that, the single question was reasonableness of time. In which own protection was one, but not actually the most prominent feature of the justification. Thirdly, there is simply nothing that can be derived, we say, with respect from this case, for inferring that this is Strasbourg declaring that own protection amounts to not simply a factor to take into account as to the reasonableness of time for which someone has been detained, but also amounts to a ground for lawful detention capable of being shoehorned in to the exhaustive list of grounds in Article 5.1a to f. Had that been the case, one may have expected say rhetorically, for the court to have said so, and one may have expected the case to receive somewhat greater prominence than it did. This is a matter of oh. interest. He was um, convicted, wasn't he, of the murder? And I just wondered what the, the, um, the finding was, uh, the consequence of the breach. Yes, I think he's, he's convicted, then the appeal court overturns mm -hmm. that conviction. And I think we leave the story, but I could double check. I think we leave the story before um, his case returns, but I, I'm, anyway, he gets that might course. be my misreading. But he, um, anyway, he gets. He, he, you'll, you'll see from one two four that he, he, get, he gets an award of damages. Is it damages or costs? And costs, I think. Oh, it's costs. Yeah. He claimed damages and he got costs. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. Well, uh, paragraph uh, 127 is a no. rather, rather abrupt way of dealing with the, no doubt, careful submissions. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> it also suspects that my answer as to what happened may be wrong, because that does rather suggest that there was a return to court and a guilty verdict. But um, in, in any event, um, uh, it does. Yes. Um, so that's uh, 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 my fourth point under, under IA is it's an analysis that is obviously explains uh, 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 um, the fact that the fact that this can go into five three is obviously explained by uh, uh, um, factors that are relevant solely to five three, which is the reasonableness of detention, the length of the detention. It's a factor, and it's a particularly important factor in other in other in other jurisdictions within the Council of Europe where, unlike here, there can be extraordinarily long periods of pre-trial detention. It's unsurprising, we would say, that a range of factors would need to be produced to justify that detention under 5.3, but it tells us nothing about the contents of the rights in 5.1. And it's not taken further by the, by the second case relied on by his lordship, which is Bizarre, which you'll find at tab 22. This is not only a case just about 5.3, or the relevant passages are just about 5.3. Actually, there were detention, the detention wasn't ever justified on the basis of aim protection in this case. It wasn't an issue in this case. The most we get is a reference up to um, IA and, and, and the basis under 5.3 for assessing the length of detention in part by the need to protect the individual. We can see why bail was initially denied in this case at paragraph 13. Uh, uh, the seriousness, last sentence, he's, he's kept in because of the seriousness of the offence, the risk of influencing witnesses, and the risk of reoffending. And those are generally the, the reasons that remain present throughout. We can see at paragraph 61 that although it was put by the applicant originally as an Article 5 1 case, the court disagreed. They thought this is all about 5.3. That's, par that's paragraph 61.
And then we see at paragraph 86 an important distinction between the protections in 5.1c and 5.3, that's at 86. While paragraph 1c of Article 5 sets out the grounds on which pre-child detention may be permissible in the first place, paragraph 3, which forms a whole with the former provision, lays down certain procedural guarantees, including the rule that detention pending trial must not exceed a reasonable time, thus regulating its length. Reinforces the point that I made, which is it would be very surprising if you take a procedural protection in Article 3 and somehow convert that to a substantive ground for detention in Article 5.1. That's illogical and unprincipled, and it's not what the court is saying. They're saying the opposite. And then 87 to 88. Could you just look at 87? Yes, my lady. It no longer suffices. I'm just not interested in, in, in what you say about the first part of that. Yes. My lady, the, the, to get into 5.3 under this link, mm. you've got to have um, affected detention for the purposes of securing before the court on a reasonable suspicion of commission of criminal offence, and that justifies it. But when you've held somebody for an extended period of time, that alone, the court is saying, is not enough. Because there are additional procedural safeguards that apply when one has an extended period of time, and one of which, the court has said, is the, the own protection of an individual. The starting point, then, is, however, that the original reason has, 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 has lost its potency. Well, it's not enough to justify an extended period of time of itself, of itself. It's saying nothing more complicated than that, we submit. And just for your... So after a certain point of time, it's Article 5.1c++. Yes, well, because... Additional safeguards on top of. Yes, that's what Article 5.3 is, is, is designed to do. I mean, that's we would respectfully submit an, uh, it's unremarkable that the court is saying here. You need, you, if you're going to hold somebody for an extended period of time, you need a bit more. Well, that, that's in your first sentence, paragraph eighty-eight. Yes. Just, just for your note, uh, paragraphs one hundred and fifteen to one hundred and twenty-two uh, is um, the conclusions of the court on the facts of this particular case um, that uh, detention was unlawful under five three because the reasons for continued detention didn't stand up to scrutiny. So again, we say, um, this case takes us nowhere. So that's part six of six. Can I just draw it together in a sentence or two? My learned friend uh, submits in his skeleton for what he expressly contends to be an expansive approach the interpretation of Article 5.1c. You'll note paragraph 1.3 of his skeleton argument. And he also accepts paragraph 33, Roman numeral 2, that his lordship went beyond the wording of Article 5. And he accepts that if Article 5.1 is to be read by way of exhaustive and constrained approach, the appellant must succeed. And for the reasons given, find the traditional tools of interpretation, including reference and context to the fundamental purposes, looking at the very limited extension of a flexibility doctrine. There is simply no room, room to read the uh, 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 convention the way that his lordship did and my learned friend contends for. And if that is right, there is no way that Section 38 can be read compatibly with Article 5. So you just gave a paragraph reference then to the respondent's skeleton argument. Yes, my lord. Um, firstly, paragraph. Give me a page. Yes, page, page. Um, paragraph 1.3, my lord will find at uh, yes, page 42. Yes, got that. And then paragraph 33.2, my lord, just give me one moment. 33.2, which is puzzling. 
3.2. It's 3, I'm so sorry, 3.3 .3, Roman numeral 2, page 46. Right. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Could I move to ground 3? Yes. I can seek to identify three applicable convention principles that govern the operation of section 38. Um, this is all assumed that the court is against me on my primary submissions on grounds one and two. So I'm going to three principles, uh, and, um, and then I'm going to identify two reasons why those uh, principles haven't been met in this case. The principles are these. Firstly, detention should only be authorised under these provisions in exceptional circumstances point recognised by his lordship at paragraph 51, page 74. Two, consideration must be given to alternative means of protecting the individual, recognised by his lordship at paragraph 50. And thirdly, it falls on the detainer to convincingly demonstrate that the deprivation of liberty is justified. You'll find that in a number of authorities, but for your note, by way of example, uh, S and Denmark, paragraph 77, page 698. So to convincingly demonstrate it's necessary? Uh, it's conv yes, exactly. Yes, the phrase convincingly demonstrate is the one applied by the court in that and in other authorities. Now, these are principles that would apply to any person detained for their own protection under section 38, but for the reasons set out by the interveners, relying not least on what the European Court in NART described as the wealth of important international texts, the position is a fortiori in respect of children, particularly when you're in a context such as this, which is overnight detention in an adult police cell. And that heightened level of security we submit would apply to all three of the principles that I've just set out. When looking at the custody record, one would expect to see the clearest record of consideration as to whether or not this was an exceptional circumstance justifying keeping a child in an adult cell overnight, and also see the positive steps taken to consider alternatives. What there cannot be, we respectfully submit, is room for sanctioning or rubber stamping whereby the benefit of the doubt is given to the detainor in the gaps in records in respect of a child's detention. We've seen the custody record. The uh, arrest is five days after the incident. He's arrested at home. There's no suggestion that he had been attacked or threatened in the interim. There is information relevant to his own protection. It's in the second paragraph of the reasoning. He's in a gang fight. He sustained injuries. There's a fear of repercussion. But there is no assessment of severity of risk or immediacy of risk or the level of the assessed harm, nor is there any assessment of the alternatives to the police, the prison cell, the police cell. The only other information comes from Sergeant Smith. His first statement is six and a half years after his decision to detain, and his candidly states that his recollection is entirely drawn from the record. No mention in his first statement at all of alternatives to custody being considered. His second statement is over seven years after the arrest, provides views on his opinion about detaining children. He states there was no secure accommodation available at the time and that, presumably drawing on inferences from the custody record and the fact that the appellant was subsequently bailed to his aunt, that there were no viable alternatives. There's no evidence from Sergeant Smith as to what consideration he gave to the alternatives or steps he took to investigate them, let alone any explanation as to why those alternatives might be unsuitable. As regards the second statement, his lordship was unconvinced that it had any probative value. See his... Uh, 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 conclusions at paragraph 54, page 75, which was a conclusion we say he was fully entitled to reach and was in any event right.
as I've said, any deficiencies in the evidence on behalf of the person who, has, who is holding the individual, on behalf of the detainee, any deficiency or gaps inures against the detainer, not against the detainee. So drawing that together, just to make two points as to why uh, 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 um, the custody record taken together with PC Smith is not good enough. Firstly, I don't wish to repeat myself, there's no suggestion in any of those documents that consideration was given to an exceptionality threshold, let alone how and why it was met in this case. I, I, I don't mean, obviously, for a moment to play down the seriousness of gang violence, but the fact that injuries sustained in those circumstances cannot be enough on our submission to say that the threshold is met without further inquiry and analysis. We can't tell from the record whether P.S. Smith authorised detention because he considered it exceptional or simply desirable. To be satisfied that the test is met, one would expect to see some assessment of the severity of the threat. How likely is it to occur? Uh, 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 um, the time scale in which it might eventuate. If you're saying I need to hold somebody overnight in a police cell, wh when do you suspect this is likely to happen? Uh, 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 um, well, he's going to be produced, isn't he, the next day at the youth court? Yes. Well, it can't become, my lady. No, no, I'm not undermining for a moment. But, oh. you know, I don't know the last time any of us was present in a custody suite in a police station. But um, the question is, what may be, or you know, one of the issues may be, what's the pragmatic course to take, or what course can be taken? Yes. If you've got a vulnerable child. And in difficult circumstances. Yes, my lady, and that's why the with limited resources. I mean, this is this is. I'm not saying that that um, of course one has to act according to law. Yes, of course. But um, one also has to be conscious of the of the practical difficulties that are present in police stations. But if those practical difficulties are such in a case that the only decision left to you is to detain a child overnight in the adult cell. You say then, that steps need to be taken. I follow you know, no, but, but more than that, you need, to, you, need to, you need to see the analysis. You need to see the analysis, mm -hmm. because they, in order to justify that, in order to convincingly demonstrate, you need to justify it. And our kind, of, our kind of public policy point underlying that is if this provision is to be used in a way that could possibly be compatible with the, child, with the general child protection framework, there needs to be a clear as to what it is custody sergeants need to think through and what they need to demonstrate. And here we have virtually nothing. And the other answer to my lady's concerns is that actually there is an answer to that that is not the police cell in, mo in most scenarios. And that's the answer that is um, illustrated by the... Yes, because they have, an, they, have a, they have an absolute obligation to take. Now, there may be some circumstances in which the only accommodation, the only accommodation suitable for an individual child is secure accommodation. And it may be that there is no secure accommodation available, and they're simply too dangerous, to, to use loose language, to be, to be placed anything in anything other than secure accommodation. Now, that's not the suggestion here. There's nothing on the evidence that suggests that, that was the thought process that went through. There's an assertion that secure accommodation wasn't available, but there is nothing to suggest that Sergeant Smith thought, well, I'm going to speak to the local authority and find out what is available. And they have an absolute obligation to say yes and to, to take the child. I'll leave that to my to, 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 to my, my name is Galahad to show you the, the relevant provisions as, as how it works under Section 21. There's a duty. I, I, um, I seem to remember in some of the case law that's cited. But we'll, we'll come to that. Yes. But the, the answer we respectfully submit cannot be to, um, whilst identifying there may be pragmatic and compelling reasons, is to say, I'm going to assume them in any given case, or simply the fact that this is gang-related violence and it happened when an individual was living with their parents means that I can exercise this power. If this power exists in a way that is compatible with Article 5, then we would respectfully submit that there are compelling reasons for public policy, while the court has to make it absolutely abundantly clear the steps that a custody sergeant has to go through and record in order to make good the legality of that detention. And 
sanctioning his attention on the evidence that we've got here would send, we respectfully submit, completely the wrong message. Because if this meets an exceptionality threshold, if this is what convincingly demonstrated looks like, uh, uh, it is not going to fulfill the uh, important competing public policy imperative of protecting children. Milady, I encapsulated in that answer my second point, which is the need to look for alternatives and the absence of consideration of alternatives. And I also encapsulated what was going to be my, my final point about the general importance and the public importance and the need we would respectfully submit for this court to make it plain, if you're against me on ground one and two, that the importance of the liberty of vulnerable children is such that the sanction, the exceptional sanction of detention in the police cell overnight needs to be properly justified through the steps mandated by Section 38, my Lord. Can I just be clear, Mr. Herman? Do these submissions go to the decision to detain or, or the subsequent decision where to detain? Or, or, or perhaps both? No, well, uh, uh, both, because, my Lord, um, the alternative to a police cell detention would not, in our respectful submission, have been a uh, at somewhere where he was deprived of his liberty. Am I, answer, am I answering a completely different question to my Lord? Am I giving a completely different answer to the question my Lord asked? Well, well, well the first question is um, the decision to detain. Yes. Uh, if the decision is taken to detain, mm. the, is then a subsequent question as to where to detain and in what circumstances? And I, I just want to be clear as to whether your submission goes to the first stage or the second stage. The first, my lord. Or both. The first, my lord. The first. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Two short questions, please, Mr. Hanna. Um, no criticism is made of paragraph 24 of the judgment where the judge draws together the relevant propositions as he sees them, save I, I think probably you would not be happy with 24E in the sense that it elides Articles 5, 1 and 3. But everything else I think is consistent with your... It is, my lady, yes. Is yes. that a fair comment that is, about 24E? That, that, well? that, 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 that's very for, that, that is very fair. Okay. Um, except all A to D, we may have some... We would say that uh, 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 some finessing of E. Well, <laughs> F is um, all well and good, we say, until the very last clause, which needs a qualification yes. in respect of the second. So it's limited to the second limb in the ways that I've identified. Thank you. And then, uh, finally, you don't shrink from the conclusion the judge reaches at paragraphs 39 to 41, or 39 and 40 in particular, how far do you go? But if you're right, it means that... Uh, any detention on own protection grounds um, would be incompatible with Article, Article 5. Yes, that inevitably flows yes. from, from, from my submissions, my lady, yes. My lady, those are the submissions on behalf of the appellant. Well, thank you very much. We'll sit again at 2 o'clock.